Hey, welcome to episode 16 of SpaceX in the News. Today, we're gonna dive deep on this weekend's first launch of Crew Dragon. We'll discuss what's going on in Boca Chica with Starhopper. We'll briefly speak about Starlink. This week's honorable mention is just a little bit different. Over the weekend, I went and saw the new Apollo 11 film. So I'm really excited just to give a quick little review on that. And then today, we're actually gonna end this episode a little bit differently with the motivating message I've been told to share with you. Let's get started. In the early hours of Saturday morning, SpaceX took the next huge step toward putting American astronauts in space on American rockets. The long-awaited and highly anticipated Crew Dragon capsule was mounted on top of a Falcon 9 rocket and erected on pad 39A, the very same launch pad that allowed Apollo astronauts to go to the moon in the 1960s and early 1970s. The mission objective for this launch was to test out the capsule and all of its instruments, but it also took cargo to the International Space Station. I mean, why not? If it's going to the ISS, you might as well make good use of it, right? But NASA cargo wasn't the only thing riding in this capsule. A test dummy named Ripley was dressed up in a SpaceX spacesuit and went along for the ride, Ripley being Sigourney Weaver's character in the movie Alien. But Ripley isn't your average dummy. She was loaded full of instruments and sensors so NASA could measure and see the effects of this launch on a human body. But still, she wasn't alone. Like Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway, she would set sail with a little round friend. Yeah, at the very last minute, Elon decided to put in a little plush toy of the Earth with appendages and everything, calling it a super high-tech zero-G indicator, which is just fancy talk for something he wants to see float around in the capsule. The guy just cracks me up. And because he decided to do this, these plush toys became extremely expensive. So anyway, for this launch, SpaceX and NASA decided to team up for the webcast. And while it was cool to see the synergy, from what I gather on social Social media most people did not really care for it most people complaining that the video feed was pretty poor compared to what they're used to the 720 was the highest resolution you could get I actually did my second live webcast to cover this launch you know it was a lot of fun I did it to coincide with my 10,000 subscriber special so again congratulations to the winners thank you everyone who stopped by for my webcast and a very special thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my channel to help me reach that 10,000 supporter mark so yeah together we got to watch SpaceX make history as it launched its crew dragon capsule into orbit around the earth successfully we land its Falcon 9 booster, undock from the second stage, and we even got to watch Earth Wilson float around the capsule. What a great night it was. Then a day later on Sunday morning, SpaceX and NASA once again teamed up to webcast Crew Dragon's rendezvous and docking with the International Space Station. Now the Crew Dragon capsule isn't designed to dock with the International Space Station like the Cargo Dragon is. While the Cargo Dragon bursts with the space station using a remotely operated arm by an astronaut on the station itself, Crew Dragon docks with the space station autonomously, which just means it does it on its own. And the footage that was broadcasted by NASA from the space station was actually really cool. You could see it approaching as it flew over the Earth, you could watch it as the astronauts on the space station tested out its backup procedures, commanding it to turn on its lights, commanding it to stop, commanding it to abort, and then commanding it to dock. Stop capture confirmed. And then shortly after the capsule was docked with the space station, the three astronauts on board entered Crew Dragon for the first time in space. After the launch of Crew Dragon on Saturday morning, NASA did put on a press conference. And there were a few things I took away from it that I wanted to share with you guys. The first being Elon's hilarious response to this woman's question. Mary Liz Bender with the Planetary Society. Elon, you've spent 17 years pushing past adversity, doubt, and you must feel incredible to finally be at this stage. I'm just curious what advice you have to all the dreamers out there that are dealing with the same kind of doubt that you did. Oh, I always thought we would fail, so this is uh, all, it's all upside. You know, I thought maybe we had a 10% chance of reaching orbit starting out, so then uh, yeah, people thought uh, when we started SpaceX, they said, oh, you're gonna fail. Uh, so I agree, I think we probably will fail, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so not to worry, Elon uh, does have more confidence in his spacecraft now that Crew Dragon has a successful launch on its, on its record. And he even said that he'd be willing to fly on it one day. The first two NASA astronauts that will fly on Crew Dragon on Demo 2 this summer were also ready to hitch a ride. We're feeling pretty good about it, and it's really about each one of these milestones getting accomplished and, you know, giving us more confidence in the future. And what's interesting is that we've all been focused so much on Starship lately that we shouldn't forget that it was actually Crew Dragon that was supposed to take the first private citizens to space. And according to Elon Musk, that very well could still be a possibility. Once Dragon is in, in regular operation, I think we will, we will um, seek uh, commercial customers, uh, of which the, 
NASA Administrator and, and that NASA in general has been very supportive of, of, that, of that idea. And the very last thing I want to show you from this press conference is that Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, was there. He even got to ask a question. Uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, when you had the, the failure of, of landing and you had a block freeze of the Falcon 9, uh, you know, block 5, um, you're unable to make changes uh, according to NASA's requests. Uh, how did it, you know, when you have non-mission critical things like grid fin hydraulic pumps that seize, what were you able to do as far as, you know, you're in a freeze of the vehicle, how did that affect certification going on? Were you able to make tweaks to the hydraulic systems? Were you able to add a redundant pump already? Or did it not, is that not considered a freeze, I guess, or what's that like, I guess? We were able to fix the, the grid fin hydraulic uh, pump stall uh, pretty easily, actually without having a redundant pump. Uh, it, it, there just turned out to be like a bizarre sort of stall zone, and, and with a little bit of a, a tiny relief valve, we were able to fix it. It's easy. Yeah, I'm jealous. Hello, is this a Jenny school? But even if I had a million subscribers, I don't know if I'd ever be invited to these things. Because if they took my question, I'd have to stand up and go, yes, Kevin Haymire, Cloud Licker. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the Boca Chica site and Starhopper. So like I often do, I asked local resident Boca Chica Maria what's been going on at the site lately. Well, she told me that lately the workload has been light, there have been quiet nights, still more work going on at the launch site, but there are rumors that hop tests have been delayed now till June. Whether that's true or not, hasn't been confirmed. Regardless, nobody working at the site is just sitting around. Things are still getting done. Here's some aerial footage of the construction site and the launch site taken last week on Monday. And now you can compare it to these photos taken five days later on Saturday. As you can see in the top right corner there, on Monday there was nothing there. And then five days later, a new piece for the upper half of Starhopper appears. Here it is from another angle. Boca Chica Maria also enlightened me on what's been going on with local residents in SpaceX. As you can see, there's a small neighborhood called The Village that exists between SpaceX sites. And it's no secret that over the last few years, SpaceX has been buying these houses from some of these residents. Maria says, I believe SpaceX owns five or six houses now. Some will be dozed down. Their converted med house is fully stocked now. A couple from Ontario sold it to SpaceX last year. A lot of locals are anxious to find out what SpaceX has in store for that community. Whatever their ultimate plans might be, SpaceX hasn't said a word about it. Okay, so let's quickly talk about Starlink. Apparently they might have some new competition. A satellite company called OneWeb aims to provide uninterrupted internet access across the world with a focus on affordability for those living without a basic communications infrastructure. If that all sounds familiar, that's because it's basically what SpaceX plans to do with their Starlink constellation. While over a year ago, SpaceX successfully demonstrated that their test satellites work, OneWeb has completed a demonstration launch placing the first six satellites in a circular orbit a thousand kilometers above the Earth. If these satellites operate nominally, the company's constellation could be completed by late 2020 or early 2021. Thanks to the relative simplicity and lower mass of OneWeb spacecraft, as well as partnerships with industry heavyweights Airbus Defense and Space, and the partial completion of a floor-based satellite factory, OneWeb undeniably has several steps up on SpaceX, at least with the respect to the goal of reaching initial commercial operations as quickly as possible. However, Elon Musk is dead set on commencing deployment of his Constellation satellites no later than June of 2019. Obviously, his Starlink satellites will go up on Falcon rockets. Meanwhile, OneWeb will launch 21 times on Soyuz 2 rockets. But I'm not worried, and I don't think you should be either. I mean, this is Elon Elon Musk and SpaceX we're talking about, right? In fact, news just released less than a week ago that the Air Force Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Office just awarded SpaceX a $28 million contract to test over the next three years different ways in which the military might use Starlink. So that is awesome news for SpaceX. And to be honest, after reading this article, I feel like the military might be too enthusiastic about it. Quoting them as saying that they're ready to issue contracts to SpaceX to test out Starlink as soon as they start launching spacecraft. We're not waiting for them to have full capacity and then start the whole process. We have the funding and the vehicles in place to do it now. Also saying the Air Force is really happy with Starlink's first two satellites, 1010A and B, and now saying that the Air Force is waiting for the commercial companies to catch up to military demand. And while that sounds horrible, they're ready and waiting for them to get the systems up and in place. Maybe between the military and Space Force, I have a feeling SpaceX is gonna have a lot of business in the future. All right, so again, this week's honorable mention is actually me doing a review on the new Apollo 11 film that came out. So without any further ado, here's Cloud Licker Kevin out in the field. Hey guys, so I'm here at my local AMC Theatres and I'm here to watch the new Apollo 11 film slash documentary that just came out yesterday actually. It's only available in theaters for a week, but it's about the Apollo 11 moon landing 
where Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins went to the moon in 1969. And they're using uh, refurbished, if you want to use the word refurbished, uh, and, and enhanced footage that they actually shot during the mission. So it should be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. And Neil Armstrong, just like a lot of other people, is, is my favorite astronaut. You know, I grew up where Neil Armstrong is from, and uh, my dad actually delivered mail to his house that he grew up in. So uh, Neil Armstrong has always been like a personal hero of mine. So I'm really looking forward to this film. I've been looking forward to it for a couple months now. And I'm gonna go in there now. I'm gonna sit down and watch it and uh, I'll come back out and let you guys know how it is. All right, doses. Okay, so I, uh, I just left the theater and um, I wanna get this out right now while it's still fresh in my memory. But that was, that had to be one of the best, if not the best documentary I have ever seen in my life. Ah, oh, man. The footage they used was so well done. Like, I, I can't believe they made, they turned that old grimy, grainy looking footage into uh, such, you know, great film. It was like, it was like the documenters, the cameramen took a camera with them back in time and shot sequences deliberately in an order. It was crazy. I couldn't believe they shot some of the, the things they shot back in the 60s and it looked the way it did and, and you know they managed to capture the the feel of what was going on not just with the apollo program and the astronauts and the engineers but what was going on with society at the time um in relation to the program it felt like everyone was involved it felt like everybody wanted to be involved and even though you had things like civil rights going on and the vietnam war it felt like everyone was at least on par with landing a man on the moon and achieving this awesome goal. Okay, so spoiler alert, uh, they did land on the moon, okay? And they made it back safely. But I do wanna say they started this documentary uh, right before the three astronauts started uh, making their way up the, up, the, up the rocket and the launch tower. And they ended it after they were quarantined on Earth. And they were really specific. I saw a lot of footage I have never seen before. I would say for every... A shot that I've seen before there was at least one shot that I haven't seen before and again it was all superb and I got excited whenever I saw recognizable faces like Werner Von Braun and it looked like it looked like you were there and this was just happening this could have happened yesterday the, the footage was that clear so I highly recommend this movie and if you are going to see it you got to see it on the biggest screen you can I watched it in IMAX and not only was the picture huge but the really cool thing was the sound when that Saturn V took off you felt like you were being vibrated out of your seat. Aces. And I want to leave you with this. The really inspiring and motivating thing I, I thought about often when I was watching this was we are basically starting this era all over again. We are, within the next 10 years, going back to the moon to stay. We are going to Mars for the first time. So as exciting as it was to me to you know live this moment during the 60s with NASA, it was even more exciting to think, Holy cow, we're doing this again, but we're going even further this time. You know, growing up, I always thought it'd be cool to go back in time and live in the 60s and experience everything that NASA was doing back then. But these days, I am just so thankful that I'm alive when I am because we're going to go even further now. Thank you very much, Cloud Licking Kevin, and thank you for that abrupt ending. So yeah, in retrospect, I wouldn't really call it a documentary uh, because documentaries imply that someone's narrating it and that people are being interviewed. This film just utilized footage taken from the 1960s, and yet it told the whole story from A to Z in a really impressive style. Go see it before it's too late. Okay, so today I'm gonna to end this video in a different way. Going back to what we talked about earlier with NASA and SpaceX's press conference they put on after Crew Dragon's first launch, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine gave a really motivating speech, and he asked members of the media to please share it. Now, I don't consider myself a member of the media. I'm Cloud Licker Kevin. But I was so inspired by his words that I just felt compelled to share it with you guys. I hope what he says really excites you like it did me. And you know, I just gotta say, this poor guy got a lot of guff when he was appointed as NASA's administrator last year by President Trump. You know, people saying he wasn't experienced or whatever. I've seen more of his face out there trying to promote NASA's message than any administrator before him. I mean, I just love this guy's enthusiasm. I think he's a really good leader. And as you're about to see, him and Elon Musk agree on a lot of things and I think they make a really awesome team. I do sincerely believe that this guy's gonna be the one that takes NASA out of their slump and into the future. He's got a positive and can-do attitude, and that's the same kind of mentality that Werner Von Braun had. So I'm gonna bug out here, but I'm gonna leave you with his awesome message. Thank you so much for watching. Godspeed, you guys.
So I'll go ahead and um, and close it out. Uh, you know, we just heard Elon say he'd he'd be interested in having a permanent presence on the moon. For sure, we should do it. Well, that's um, that's the that's the very first space policy directive given by the president of the United States to me as the NASA administrator that we're going to go to the moon and we're going to go sustainably. So, what that means is. Um, when we say sustainably, that means we're going to stay. And of course, the objective here is uh, not just humans, but also landers and rovers and robots and humans, and, uh, and, and, and utilizing our international partners and utilizing our commercial partners. And uh, there's no doubt SpaceX, SpaceX has some really amazing ideas about what they could help us do at the moon and what they could help the coalition of international partners do as we develop this together. But the President's Space Policy Directive is clear. We're going to the moon. We're going sustainably. We're going with international partners. We're going with commercial partners. We're going to utilize the resources of the moon. That's a critically important part of the agenda. Why? We have to be able to live and work on another world for long periods of time. We have to be able to use those resources of another world, mm -hmm. which is of course, a, a great opportunity for us to prove those capabilities and technologies on the moon because, as it happens, you know, Mars and Earth are only aligned once every 26 months on the same side of the sun, which means when we go to Mars, which I know is high on Elon's agenda and it's high on NASA's agenda, um, when we go to Mars, we have to be there for long periods of time. So we have to figure out how to, how to do in situ resource utilization. Uh, and then ultimately we need to prove all of this out at the moon, which is a three-day journey from Earth, which means we, we have a risk mitigation capability right there. We've seen what happens with Apollo 13. When something goes wrong, you can get home. If something goes wrong on the way to Mars, it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and so that's why the moon matters. It's why the moon is so important. It's the proving ground. And then at the end, um, we want to take all those technologies, all those capabilities. We want to retire the risk. And, and go to Mars. There's great alignment uh, between NASA and our commercial partners. And as we're seeing now with our international partners just yesterday, I don't even know what day it is. It's like <laughs> two days sure. ago, I guess now, we had a great announcement from, uh, from Canada. And they announced that they're going to be with us for the next 24 years in our sustainable return to the moon. And that's the kind of long-term enduring commitment that we need. We need to grow the international partnership, and that means the partners that are currently there, we need them to help us in a bigger level. The International Space Station, amazing, amazing development uh, that has proven the concept. We need to grow it. We need every piece of the architecture between the Earth and the Moon to include our international partners. It's not just about Gateway. It's not just about the International Space Station, but it's about the entire exploration agenda in three different theaters that includes low Earth orbit, that includes the Moon, and it includes Mars. And putting together a, a grand bargain, if you will, between our international partners and our commercial partners in a way that can be transformative for generations to come so that we can have that permanent presence of humans on another world, starting with the Moon and eventually yeah. Mars. And um, Absolutely. It's, a, it's a bright future right now. And I will say this, and I, I say this every time I have the opportunity to talk to an audience, and with all the cameras here, it's more important than ever. The President's first budget request increased our budget at NASA by a billion dollars, which was about a 5% increase. And then even before I got sworn in as the NASA Administrator, a bipartisan Congress in both the House and the Senate plussed us up by $1.7 billion. So I thought I was coming in to advocate for a bigger budget, and in fact, <laughs> by the time I got there, it was actually smaller than what Congress had already given us, which is a really good problem for NASA to have. Um, and interestingly, today, as, as Elon and I were out on, uh, on the launch pad, 39A, we, uh, we had a conversation about why he got involved in this to begin with, and it was to inspire America to increase NASA's budget because of the return we get on those activities. Now, it is true, you know, the idea that we can put humans on another world for long periods of time is great, but the benefits humanity has received from space exploration in general is immeasurable. The return on investment we get from that as a nation, and in fact as a world, the way we communicate, all of these cameras, direct TV, dish network, internet broadband from space. I see a lot of people here that are going to put this on the internet. We talk about um, 
XM radio, for example, but the way we communicate, the way we navigate, the way we produce food. I was recently at the Ag Expo, and you know we're sensing the Earth in every part of the mag electromagnetic spectrum, and because of that, we can increase crop yields, we can reduce water usage. At the same time, we can preserve nitrates in the soil, feeding more of the world than ever before because of what NASA does. That's an amazing capability. And we didn't develop the satellites for that purpose. But because we have that data, we can share it, not only with the United States farmers, but around the world. We, we saved tens of millions of dollars in disaster relief that would have gone to Uganda. But be, because we were able to predict ahead of time uh, a disaster situation developing, we could mitigate and save not only money for us in, in the form of aid, but also lives in Uganda. But the way we produce food, the way we understand weather, the way we understand climate, the way we do you know, national security and disaster relief, all of these things were born. And I understand a lot of it's commercialized, and we're, we love that. Help save our, us money at NASA. But a lot of it's commercialized. A lot of it has, is, is done by the Department of Defense. But at the end of the day, it's born from this little agency that occupies less than one half of 1% of the federal budget and the return on that has been astonishing. So the idea that this event today was, was born from a concept of how do, we, how do we encourage Americans to increase the NASA budget. Um, mm -hmm. Friends, we have that opportunity right now, and, and it is, in fact, happening uh, with bipartisan support in Congress and support from the administration. So we're, we're at a great time. Um, today's event was, was amazing to watch, and over the next five days we're going to see a lot more milestones be achieved and certainly as an agency and as a country and really as a world with our international partners we're going to be able to do more than ever before so I just want to thank everybody with the TV cameras and the and the iPhones get this message to the world it's an important message and I'm so grateful for all of you being here and covering this very important achievement in American history so thank you guys so much <laughs>